been watching this show for a while will know that I'm a pretty positive person when it comes to games about seducing anime boys. I'm critical, yeah, but I want my reviews to be useful rather than just entertaining. Even if a game's got some flaws, or some bumps, or warts, or a giant caterpillar growing out of its left eye socket, I'll still try and make sure it gets a fair shake rather than blindly hating on it like a stereotypical screaming, swearing, angry YouTuber. For once though, that approach really isn't going to work. So if you've been secretly hoping for another vicious Nicole style rant video where I get good and nasty, this one's for you. I'm about to stand here, get mad, and let you know about a game that took me on a vomit-inducing roller coaster ride, from charmed to intrigued to confused to bored and finally goddamn fucking furious. So, pull up a nice warm bag of popcorn and get ready for me to spew some hot shit about Oz Mafia, possibly the most disappointing Otome game I've ever played. In Oz Mafia, you play a waifish amnesiac girl who gets menaced by roughed up ruffians saved by a group of delicious anime dudes, and invited to live in their giant mansion as a gormless freeloader. Stop me if you've heard this one before. But the draw here isn't the trite, overdone premise, it's the setting. Oz Mafia takes place in a pseudo-medieval fantasy town that's divided among six warring factions. Which isn't really that original either now that I think about it. Anyway, this game's unique twist is that the game's grizzled gangsters are actually fairy tale characters. So it's sort of like The Wolf Among Us, if The Wolf Among Us was a cutesy pastel dating game. And just as you'd expect, it's up to our pink haired protagonist to relentlessly bother these magical mobsters until they fall head over heels in love with her. So let's get darn to it, shall we? Characters Romance. First up, we have the Oz Familia. Familia? Eh. They're led by Karamiya, aka the Lion. He's a brave, charismatic tactician who's also something of a bookworm, spending all his time nose deep in some heavy duty nonfiction whenever he's not leading his mafia soldiers on the battlefield. He's a perfect gentleman with pretty much no character flaws whatsoever, except for the fact that he has a bit of a weakness to mind control magic. But I'm sure that's never gonna come up in every single fucking route, right? Karamiya's second in command is Kirie the Scarecrow, a sly smirking sadist slash salacious scandalous sex fiend. He's a master manipulator and a consummate troll whose main role is to pop up in random scenes and say something suggestive or rude and then leer gleefully as everyone else is like, oh, whatever would you say that, be still my heart. Kirie is funny, he's likeable, affectionate, and far more genre savvy than he has any right to be. Seriously, in this game, Scarecrow is best girl. Our final Oz is Axel, the Tin Man. Befitting his literary origin, he's a heartless antisocial stick in the mud. I tried his route first because usually I get off on stoicism, but dear lord, this guy is more grating than sandpaper. It's like throwing your love at a brick wall. Hey, Axel, let's go to the park. <sighs> Fine. I baked you a cupcake. It tastes like ass. His confession comes out of nowhere after treating you like shit for half the game, and all the blood suddenly rushes to his pants, and he goes from being an unrepented dickbag to a blushing, shy, stuttering wooby woo with a hair trigger erection in a matter of seconds. Which just makes him that much more unattractive. They tried to make him somewhat relatable by giving him a weapons grade sweet tooth, but it's so ridiculously overdone that at times he will resort to eating handfuls of sugar straight out of the bag. Ew. Next up, we have Familia Grimm, led by Scarlet, aka Lil Dude Riding Hood. He's a skilled sharpshooter with a complex about his lack of height and baby-faced androgyny, which isn't helped by the fact that you think he's a girl for a good chunk of his route. Despite his position as leader of a mafia family, he's an optimistic pacifist who longs for the day everyone will stop trying to viciously slaughter each other. 
Which is hilariously ironic, considering his two underlings, Hansel and Gretel, are the two most batshit violent psychopaths in all of Fantasyland. Familia Boots is naturally made up entirely of cat girls and led by the Lady Knight Pache. She's devoted to honor, discipline, training every day, becoming a true knight of the sword, and bringing the world revolu- Wait, no, wrong swordswoman. But before you get your hopes up, no, this isn't the lesbian route. Hell, she isn't even a very good friends route. Nope, her route revolves around her inexplicable crush on... Axel? Really? Well, damn. She realizes that brainless waifs like you get more ding-dong than strong female characters, so she buys a cute dress and tries to learn how to bake apple pie and walk in stiletto heels. Gotta love damn traditional gender roles, am I right? Yay! Heteronormativity! Robin Hood, the mysterious town doctor who has sworn to heal any injured party, regardless of their affiliation. He's got a bit of an airheaded affectation and wears a mask because... Reasons that are never actually explained. He's sort of like the love child of Shu and Kazuaki from Heart of a Boyfriend, with about the same level of latent psychosis and requisite tortured past. I'm usually a fan of the toxic relationship type roots, just because I love that little taste of angst and danger, but Robin's root just left a really nasty taste in my mouth. Specifically, the taste of Rohypnol! Speaking of fucking, meet Man Boy, or rather, Man Boy and every single other employee of the Oscar Wilde brothel. Man Boy's an old fashioned gentleman and a highly accomplished sex worker who falls madly in love with our brainless protagonist. Which really fucking sucks for him, as it doesn't take many more meetings before you're noticed by the brothel's other professionals the deranged masochist Alfani and the absolutely dilftacular yet stunningly sociopathic Dorian Gray. The two of them decide to make it their mission to transform you into a panting hedonist who wants nothing in life but six million dicks, and so you spiral down the dark path of sex, drugs, and dubious consent. This route is by far the smuttiest one, and depending on your attitude towards trashy erotica, it's either the worst thing you've ever read, or so goddamn over the top terrible that it loops around and becomes the best ending. There are two other Mafia families, Familia Edelheide, led by Heidi, the one-note fat joke played by a male voice actor, and Familia Anderson, led by an eight-year-old pyromaniac, who are the game's comic relief villains that are too weak and stupid to actually accomplish anything. There's no dateable roots here, although I wouldn't mind hooking up with that six-inch tall Osan Butler. Huh, didn't know I was into that. And finally, you have the hilariously named Wolfgang, led by Caesar, the big bad wolf. Dude doesn't give two shits about being the leader though. He thinks he's the game's main villain, constantly threatening to take down all the mafia families, and chasing around our amnesiac protagonist and trying to murder the hell out of her for no good reason at all. In reality though, He's a completely ineffectual fop who gets his ass kicked more than Krillin. Whenever he pops up, instead of being worried in any way, everyone's just like, Christ, this douchebag again? He reminds me of a little Karibo character. Hello everyone, I'm very scary. Look, I've got two swords and I don't button my shirt. I'm a big spooky monster and I'm going to eat you all. He's a dateable root, but instead of being the problematic yandere you might expect, instead it's endearingly pathetic watching this bug prance around pretending to be a badass. And the Wolfgang's second in command is so, Caesar's best friend. By which I mean Caesar's only friend. By which I mean Caesar freeloads on So's couch and eats beef stew while the kid's out running the town's only food truck for rent money. So's an all-around sensitive little sweetheart who's really nice, and his route goes basically nowhere. There's also a secret route, which involves you stopping one of the game's actual primary villains, but in order to discuss it, I'd have to spoil the shit out of it. So instead, I'll just say that it's not as over-the-top campy as some routes, but not as drop-dead boring as others. And none of the stuff that happens in this route actually matters. 
None of the things that happen in any of the routes actually matter, but I'll be touching on that a bit later. Oh, and if you think these character descriptions are a bit shorter and less fleshed out than usual, it's because really, that's all the game's given me. There are quite a few characters here, many of them have no bearing on the plot at all, and the writing is so thin on the ground that it's really hard for me to come up with any descriptors beyond the Shota Kid, the Yandere Murderer, and the Stoic Tsundere. Seriously, for a triple A ultimate game, this thing's really one dimensional in terms of its dudes. And if you think I've already been a little too vicious, <laughs> sister, you ain't seen nothing yet. Gameplay. The visual novel gameplay is pretty standard here. During the week, you trail around after the three Oz boys, watching them plan cooking competitions and host beauty pageants like the hardened mafioso criminals they are. And you're given dialogue choices. On Sundays, you're given free reign to roam around the town, as there's a law in place that forbids bad guy violence on Sundays. You pick one character to hang out with for a scene, and then you're right back to your weekly all shenanigans. In practice, what this means is that not only do you have to go full Renai stalker mode on your chosen character every single week to rack up enough affection points to avoid a bad end, but that each playthrough is also a good 70-80% to 80 identical, as the Oz family slice of life stuff is the same in every route, and the plotline doesn't branch out at all until you're about 3 quarters of the way through any given playthrough. Even if you decide you want to play with the cat girl, or the brothel, or the evil wolves, you'll still be spending the majority of your time doing light-hearted cutesy-wootsy shopping stuff with the poster boys. You do get no thank you style extra spoiler vision scenes on subsequent playthroughs to gain a bit of extra insight and break up the monotony a bit. The one innovation Oz Mafia tosses into the mix is the inclusion of triangle roots. Once you've sat through several hours of Common Root and finally hooked up with your Emerald City sweetie, there'll be a ridiculously contrived misunderstanding, and then whichever Ozboy has the second highest affection will run up to you, grab your hand, and go, My lady, I've been in love with you since the start of the game! Please, leave your cruel boyfriend who's inexplicably acting like a massive shit canoe and date me! At this point, you can either choose to stay on your original route and be faithful to the guy you just spent three hours courting, or you can impulsively hitch a ride on some other guy's dick and experience an entirely new ending segment, which you should always do, because all three Oz guys are so much more complex and compelling in the cuck routes than they are in their own friggin' routes. And you get treated to a massive torrid off-screen sex, which puts a big fat fucking smile on my face, because idiotic smut beats out four stanks every time. So essentially, each of the Oz guys has four endings. Two traditional Otome romance endings, and two I cheated on my boyfriend with this douche endings. And each of the other dateable characters only has two endings. Sorry, no transfer routes outside the Oz family, no matter how much fun it'd be to shatter So's heart by hooking up with Caesar, or run away from Dr. Rapinhood to fuck the brothel. Oz Mafia has a total of 26 main endings overall, and each one typically goes fucking nowhere! You meet, you shop, you bake, you kiss, you argue for a stupid fucking reason, the baddie shows up, he gets creamed instantly, one-off bits of dialogue hint that this game might have an actual fucking story besides cake and dresses. Oh, signorina, I'm sorry, I've just- I've been so stressed out with these serial killings. Serial killings? Never mind that, let's kiss and eat pancakes. And then you get a happy ending. None of the roots ever go beyond these flippant teasers. Instead, what you're supposed to do is get all 26 endings, which takes anywhere from 30 to 50 hours, and then you unlock the epilogue, an hour-long follow-up which renders all of the rest of the game completely pointless, since it tries to make any of the endings possibly canon by referencing nothing that happens in any of them, effectively making none of them canon. The grand finale, as it's actually called, features a long, tense build-up, and then the game's real, real 
villain appears out of nowhere to fuck shit up and spat a 12 minute monologue comprised entirely of massive fucking ass pulls. It's like Huddleful Boyfriend, if instead of three hours of parody followed by a dark and twisted ending, you had 30 hours of boring bullshit followed by falling down a flight of stairs into a dumpster made of bees. You want to know why the main character has amnesia? You want to know why all these guys are at war with each other? You want to know why some roots seem completely tacked on and out of place? No, you fucking don't! Because it's dumb and fuck and will probably make you incredibly angry! You'll wonder why you spent 40 hours waiting for this shit! Jesus Christ! Presentation. Getting back on the positive track, I will say Oz Mafia is a beautiful game. The art was done by the same person who did all the character designs for Diabolic Lovers. And maybe that's why most of the dudes in this game look exactly like the guys from Diabolic Lovers. Wait, no, fuck, I'm trying to be positive here. The watercolor art style fits really well with the game's fairy tale aesthetic, and the overall look of the game is right up there with Hakuoki or Nameless. Which may explain why this game has so many positive reviews from people who'd only been playing for like an hour. It's just so pretty and the boys are hot! Recommended! Quit while you're ahead, sweetie. The music's pretty good, except for that one fucking jingle that plays during every scene transition. <laughs> And some of the songs are even very haunting, and they add even more to the game's storybook vibe. And the UI? It's pretty. Now let's get back to the ranting, shall we? No! I was so excited for this game! This review was going to be a big gushy squee fest about how awesome it is that Manga Gamer had licensed an Ultime game, and hooray for the growing American Ultime market! But then I actually played it, and I just got angry. I spent over a week playing this thing. A week sitting through hours of boring fluff and forced drama and badly paced writing that just randomly flips back and forth in intensity level between 90s aquarium screensaver and Spanish language soap opera. Some roots had me actively raging, if not outright disgusted, and it was all in the hopes that I could find some reason to recommend this clusterfuck to you. When I got to the ending, I was so hopeful, because if all that bullshit had paid off with a clever, quirky, exciting finale, I could at least say what I did with most other games, that it's worth sitting through the shitty parts just to experience the good stuff. But I can't say that! All I can say is that I'm mad I wasted 35 fucking dollars and a week of my life on this. I'm mad that I ever considered dropping $40 on the physical release. I'm mad that I told people, oh yeah, next month F is gonna be that fairy tale game. Because if I hadn't, I could have jumped ship and played something else. Anything else. I am so incredibly disappointed with this shiny, pretty looking pile of ass that I wish I could retroactively rewrite my past reviews to be less critical. You think Hakuoki's story is dumb and relies too heavily on plot contrivances? At least it's consistent and follows the rules of its own world. You think Mystic Messenger has a deeply stupid final ending? At least the rest of the game is so much fun that you don't have to worry about it. You think Nameless can be kind of a drag because the common route is really, really long and full of boring daytime bullshit? At least you don't have to play through it 20 fucking times! You think Nicole has rude, unlikable characters with sketchy motivations? Well yeah, it does. But even the guy whose entire story arc revolves around him trying to create a mind control drug doesn't actually assault you. Let me reiterate, in Oz Mafia, you literally get drugged and raped, and as hot as I usually find edgy shit like that, the way it just comes out of nowhere and then gets played off as a minor indiscretion just makes me fucking wretch. For those of you who think I was too snarky in the past, I apologize. Because yeah, the games I've played before have been flawed, but none of them came close to being this rage-inducing. Everything I've reviewed up until now gets an extra half a letter grade. I know I don't do scores, but fuck it. As for Oz Mafia, this game gets a middle finger and a poison apple. Sorry guys, but there's no happy ending to this review. 
Thanks for watching the episode, guys. If you want to see more Otomania, click the links above. On the left is two free games about dragons, April was a fool, and Autumn's journey. And on the right is Nicole, my last review where I got really fucking mad. And of course, if you really appreciate what we do here, consider supporting our Patreon. Maybe then I can buy a better game than this shit.